Um, so I just want to start this meeting. My name is Lindsay Arthur, and um, I work with the Icelandic Ministry of Education, Science, and Culture. Um, we'd like to begin with this Arctic Lands Acknowledgement adapted from the IASC State of the Arctic Report for use in our workshop today. So the circumpolar Arctic is the contemporary home to many different indigenous peoples. Wherever you may be participating in this workshop, we honor and recognize the place-based knowledge of Arctic indigenous peoples and their ancestral and contemporary stewardship of their homelands, and we welcome you to do the same. So just to get started, um, I'm just going to kind of cover some housekeeping. So this workshop is being recorded and the panel discussion will be posted to, um, to the European Polar Board YouTube and then also shared on the ASM3 website. As I mentioned right at the beginning, your, your microphones are automatically muted and will be turned on for the breakout sessions. So when we're in the breakouts and you are able to speak, please always mute your microphone when you're not speaking. Um, and it's preferred that you do have your cameras switched on when you are speaking. If you're having any trouble just during this session, um, you can use the chat box for assistance. Uh, you can also see the Zoom website support pages and We'll list a link to that um, in the chat box. So the full program for today, you probably received via email if you registered earlier than today, um, but it's also available on the ASM3 website um, as part of this, of the webinar series. So we'll share that link in the chat box as well, and you can access the program from there too. So for this workshop, um, IASC has kindly agreed to let us share their code of conduct, which they developed for ASSW 2020. And what I just wanna emphasize from this, what's most important is that we create a respectful atmosphere for dialogue. We have a lot of people joining in the discussion from all around the world today. Um, so just come to these discussions with an open mind and just note that any abuse or harassment of any kind will not be tolerated. So, Moving on. Can you head to the next slide, Joseph or Renuka? Sorry. So ASM3, the Arctic Science Ministerial, um, will be in Tokyo in May 2021. This is a ministerial meeting intended for science ministers and indigenous peoples organizations. We're grateful to be holding this webinar series to bring the concepts of the ASM3 science process forward to all Arctic research stakeholders in an open, free, and public format. So let's go through the program for today on the next slide. So we're gonna start with an overview of how this workshop came to be um, with opening remarks from our ASM3 science advisory board members from Iceland and Japan. So that's Embla Er Oldstotter and Hiroyuki Anamoto. Next, um, we'll have a panel of speakers presenting recent synthesis reports on research gaps and lessons learned from projects that have navigated many international barriers. After the panel, participants will have the opportunity to participate in breakout sessions. And I'm gonna go through the breakout sections, sessions next. Um, but really these breakout sessions aim to develop and prioritize the actions needed to more effectively address challenges and barriers in international Arctic research. So the resulting prioritized actions from these discussions will form the basis for recommendations in the final ASN3 report. So just a note on the breakout sessions, um, this is how we're going to have you all indicate which session you'd like to be a part of. So now or during the panel, um, just you can indicate which breakout session you would like to join by editing your name and putting the number of the breakout session you wish to join at the start of your name. So in the participant list um, on the screen, there's a button next to your name where you can edit it. And so you can put a one or two, three, four, or five um, at the beginning of your name. So the meeting host will take note and put you in the correct breakout room. If for some reason you can't manage to edit your name, um, you can send a chat with your preferred breakout room and the meeting host will sort it out. At the end of the panel, um, we will have a 10 minute health break. So you can grab some coffee um, and we'll prepare the breakout sessions and make sure that everybody's in the right room. 
And we just want everyone to be aware that the breakout sessions may be recorded if the reporters uh, would like a recording for note-taking purposes only. So while the panel is being recorded and will be available on YouTube, the breakout session recordings will not be posted online. They won't be made public. Um, and they're just for note-taking purposes and then they'll be deleted after the notes are complete. So without further ado, um, we can move into the opening of the panel and that's gonna start with our SAB members. Um, our science advisory board members, sorry. So that's Hiroyuki Aramoto and Emla Eyar Oldstotter, and they're gonna give you an overview um, of what this, how this workshop came to be. Okay, can I, can I start? Thank you very much for the introduction. So my name is Hiroyuki Enamoto from the uh, National Institute of Polar Research, Tokyo, Japan. Uh, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, uh, this uh, process. In preparation of the ASM3, the organizer requested various pieces of the information from participating country and organizations. This includes a two-page uh, summary. So uh, please uh, could you show the uh, Next slide. So uh, the organizer asked the summary of the Arctic research activities. And uh, then uh, the asks also uh, update of the uh, ASM project. And then asked also new project co contributing to the ASM3 uh, themes. And International collaboration and cooperation survey was also done to find the uh, possible international cooperation and also to see the uh, barriers uh, for, to the international collaboration and also ask the topics where more international could help to fill the gaps in our understanding and of the Arctic system and its global connections. And the So uh, next slide, could you show? There is a uh, many, so when we, uh, uh, review the uh, information from the survey, we were very much surprised with the uh, uh, number of opportunity for international collaborations already exist. And uh, there is uh, uh, some example of the, uh, International uh, individual exchange opportunity by German, Germany, Italian CNR, and Japan Arts Project, and the US Fulbright Arctic Initiative. So many uh, uh, individual exchange opportunities, and there are many bilateral agreements. And also, research stations and facility access are very often done. And uh, that now we are combining those uh, lists and publishing, uh, willing to publishing. Uh, as a part of ASM3 report. We hope that report will be a uh, useful tool for scientists to use the, uh, to find the opportunity and more collaborations. While there are a uh, number of variable opportunities, and but there is a more uh, space and uh, for uh, exchange and joint research activities. And now I will uh, pass the presentation over to my co-chair, Embra. So Embra, please. Thank you, Enomoto, um, uh, and thank you for inviting me to be a part of the of the session. It's a pleasure to be here today, and nice to see so many participants. Um, indeed, we have compiled a wide-ranging list of opportunities and resources for scientists to engage more internationally. Um, in addition to the basic opportunities question, we also asked a few other questions, and the responses were varied. As we were analyzing the input, it became apparent that we needed more discussion and input, particularly from Arctic residents and scientists. 
we asked what opportunities exist to encourage and support indigenous peoples and community involvement in Arctic research. There were some interesting opportunities identified here, such as the Singapore Arctic Council Permanent Participants Cooperation Package, uh, which includes scholarships for indigenous peoples to attend select master's courses in Singapore universities, customized study visits to Singapore on PP's requested area of interest, and priority placement in courses of interest to the permanent participants. However, many countries did not have such opportunities in place, nor did they have plans to. Uh, this may indeed be an area where increased efforts could be very valuable. Uh, we also asked what research topics need more international collaboration and what are the barriers to increasing collaboration. The responses here varied greatly between countries with large Arctic research programs and those with smaller programs or those just starting. Many of the responses, however, were things we have all heard and said before. We need more observations, sustained ones. We want to involve indigenous peoples, but are not sure how to go about it, so it's meaningful to all involved. Visas can be a challenge. And of course, the all important, we need more funding. As we were digesting this information, we were pleased to see that several organizations mentioned reports they had done looking into the issues around gaps and barriers. We're very pleased that they have agreed to join us here today and share what they have learned in our panel session. Uh, we plan to summarize the survey responses and include them in our final ASM3 report. However, we feel uh, that we need to do more. We need to do something proactive and we need action. However, often policymakers are not sure what actions to take. And this is why we are here and this is what we hope to achieve today. So if we get down to business, um, we uh, are very pleased that you chose to join us today and hope that this short overview has uh, started sorry has started to get your brain working. Um, next uh, next up we will have panel presentations that outline many of the barriers we've all experienced and also some great lessons learned from successful projects such as Interact and the recently completed Mosaic who have overcome these obstacles. Following this, and this is where we really need you, um, we will have breakout sessions to develop concrete steps, actions that policymakers and others can help, can take to help us achieve our goals of internationally learning more about a rapidly changing Arctic, a place where some of us are lucky enough to call home, others only dream about coming to visit, but that influences the whole world. The current slide again shows you the topics for the breakout session, so we ask you to start thinking which areas you might be able to contribute to the most and have your actions ready to discuss. Before closing, um, before closing the opening remarks, I would just like to thank our fellow ASN3 Science Advisory Board members. You can see their names on the slide. I don't need to um, ramble them. Um, the Science Advisory Board members are doing uh, a lot of hard work behind the scenes. Um, and uh, we also want to thank you for contributing, contribu con contribution from our part participating countries indigenous peoples and organizations. So thank, thank all of you. I also want to give specific thanks to the uh, ex officio team, which is on a, in a smaller box on the same slide. Um, this is a team who is going above and beyond in their work for the ASM process in, in general and have done an excellent job in organizing this session. I now will give the floor to Renuka Bate, uh, Executive Secretary of the European Polar Board for the panel presentation and discussion discussion. Renuka, I, I pass the buck to you. Thank you very much, Embla. Uh, I am really pleased to welcome you all to this um, session on gaps and barriers in international Arctic science research. Uh, 
I hope everyone is able to join us. I apologize for the technical issues we've had before. And the very first speaker on our list uh, will be Hiroyuki Enomoto, uh, who comes to us from the IASC Executive Committee. He's the vice president there, and also from the National Institute of Polar, Polar Research. Hiroyuki, please. Thank you. So uh, thank you for this opportunity uh, to introduce the, uh, this report. So, so uh, the State of Arctic Science 2020, this report uh, aimed to, the, uh, to be a synthesis of the international Arctic research activity and priority and gathered from the Arctic research committees. The report summarizes uh, uh, the information on the right side, and there are many progress, important attempts, and success. However, today uh, in this webinar, I will uh, focus uh, in emergence issues and gaps, the last three uh, item and issue uh, items. Next slide, please. The, uh, I ask is work, uh, working uh, based on the, this uh, ICAP-3 uh, strategy. ICAP-3 is uh, 10 years uh, planning uh, so process. And now it's uh, just the middle of the ICAP-3 issue. Uh, started from 2016. Uh, the uh, ICAP-3 uh, uh, 10-decadal planning uh, shows uh, the role of the Arctic in the global system observing and pro uh, predicting future climate dynamics and ecosystem response, and understanding the vulnerability and resilience of Arctic environment and societies and uh, su uh, supporting sustainable development as a big three uh, pillars. And next slide, please. The following issues are identified as the emergence Arctic research issues. Uh, coupled Arctic system, pollution, uh, source sinks, and society, uh, so social impact, and observing, forecast, uh, forecasting, prediction, and predictability, and societally relevant Arctic research. The scientists are working to progress these issues, but there are uh, gaps uh, they encounter, encountered. Next slide, please. Here's a current gap in research and or data. Uh, people find the gaps uh, in the spatial and temporal coverage of data or uh, research and uh, interdisciplinary data exchange, international data sharing, research op approaches and infrastructure. Focus on transition in Arctic natural and human system. And uh, to uh, solve these uh, so, uh, gaps, uh, next slide, please. So uh, researchers are uh, trying to find the uh, solution and uh, making many efforts, emerging issues concerning international science cooperation. Uh, the first one, science planning and coordination is a uh, uh, key. And so uh, people are looking, uh, so, seeking the best way. And there are many success stories like a mosaic, a YOP, a Horizon 2020 project, Interact, and Seon is looking for, so now developing the roads, a new roadmap for Arctic observing data system. But uh, so the principal is the uh, international collaboration and uh, Arctic and non-Arctic and also East and Western uh, nations work together is a, uh, uh, stated in this uh, report. And funding is uh, also a big issue. Now funding forum start work, working uh, to, uh, to improve this condition. Access of data and, and region and also legal frameworks are uh, a challenge. So next slide, please. And finally, the, this report concluded uh, stating some uh, important uh, uh, information. The, uh, so all, maybe all of know, as know, as all know, the Arctic is a very unique and globally important region and now quickly changing regions. And more, uh, so 
understanding of Arctic and uh, uh, its system and their connection, uh, that study will be uh, now very much needed. And I asked, uh, made this report uh, based on the science, not uh, rather, uh, not the based on the nationality. And next, please. So here, so Arctic research must be truly interdisciplinary. So there is a many uh, trial of interdisciplinary work, and but uh, we are looking for the very, very holistic and uh, strong interdisciplinary actions. The Arctic research community must improve on its effort to center the uh, priority voices and contribution of the Arctic residents and indigenous peoples. Uh, starting, so the first page of this report, uh, very often indigenous people and residents are uh, so in, introduced. And international and interdisciplinary cooperation are absolutely key to studying the Arctic system and should be encouraged and expanded. And next, please. This is the final uh, slide. Arctic data, data sharing uh, is a uh, key and uh, crucial for future success. And monitoring is done already, but not yet uh, sufficient, so enough. That is the final statement. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for that wonderful uh, short talk. Uh, our next speaker is Ella Meretta Oma, and she'll be speaking about building knowledge in SAPMI. Uh, just before I hand over to LMRET, uh, I just wanted to uh, let you all know if you have questions, could you please uh, type your question out in the chat box? Or if you'd like to ask your question, please raise your hand. We'll take all of the questions together after the talks have finished. So yeah, either type it out in the chat box or raise your hand. The second little notification is the, the number of the sessions uh, and the session titles have been copied uh, in the chat box. So could you please change your name to indicate the number in the beginning for the session that you would wish to join in the breakouts. So uh, after that little interruption, I invite Ella Maretta uh, for her talk. Ella Maretta, please. Thank you, Renuka, for giving me the floor. As Renuka said, I will be talking about building knowledge in SAPMI and share some of the lessons learned from our perspective in participating in research projects. Um, the SAMI Council is often approached by scientists and researchers wanting to collaborate on um, research questions and research projects. And in our capacity as permanent participant in the Arctic Council, we are uh, partnering up with several research institutions worldwide to do research on the Arctic. Um, so, um, yeah, next slide, please. But as several of the panelists have said before me, I mean, the Arctic is changing. The picture on the left-hand side of my slide shows me in um, me doing traditional work during summertime. I'm marking reindeer calves in. That is a very important part of my traditional way of life. But at the same time, I see the picture on the right-hand side, which is just changing the Arctic as such. It's uh, energy projects, hydropower part, uh, plants, industrial project, predators, and so forth. And on top of that, we of course have climate change. So our daily life is hard to navigate and based on the knowledge that we already have and is tailored to a particular state of mind of the Arctic, which doesn't really exist anymore. So um, in the Summer Council, we started to think about that. How can we shape the research so it's actually tailored towards questions that we need to find new answers to. And that is actually a very hard and time consuming process. Um, for us, the Sami Council, it's, it has resulted in, next slide please. Next, yeah. In, in Sami Arctic strategy, 
which have a separate section on research needs and research gaps identified by ourselves, uh, us having an, an internal process trying to hammer out our knowledge gaps, so to speak. And it's also a way of facilitating researchers that approach us so they actually are prepared when they approach us so they know how to tailor their research applications to fit our needs. Based on this strategy, we decided to participate in a big Horizon 2020 research project. Um, it was uh, time consuming, but it was also very useful for us to see what this actually means in reality, what is, um, what is expected from us as a partner, but also what can we expect from the um, science society. Our uh, experiences, um, uh, we have written an, an article on our experiences from that process. Uh, the article is called Co-Creating Research Projects, Some Personal Experiences from uh, Sama Council and the Re Arctic Researchers. Both documents can be found on our web page. Um, and, and the article, it does, it's not really something new, uh, but we're just pointing to the need for transparency, the need for uh, time to listen to each other and the respect for each other. So it's basic knowledge, really. Uh, but, the heart, but the question still remains, why doesn't it happen more often? And that is the key question, I think. Um, I have tried to uh, give a recommendation to try to target that question. Um, and I think it boils down to the funding agencies, basically. The funding agencies need to support and enable collaborative research. They need to acknowledge and understand that it is time consuming and it but it is very meaningful for both partners. So what does this, this mean in reality? Well, the aging fun, uh, funding agencies, pardon, <laughs> needs to prioritize collaboration in, in the funding calls. They all, the funding agencies also need to make collaboration a key criteria in the selection process. And I think that is very important if we are to be successful in co-creation of knowledge and the process as such. And the third point that I think is important is that the funding agencies need to accept different forms of output when you are having co-production and co-creation processes. It's not necessarily that you have the same result as in a traditional Western science project. Um, so with those words, I hope I can help in the future discussion and I will be happy to take any questions. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, the recommendations are quite important and very timely. So thank you very much for uh, coming forward with those. Our next speaker will be Lars Kullerud, uh, who comes to us from the University of the Arctic. And he'll be talking about the U-Arctic report on scientific cooperation within the Arctic. Lars, um, the floor is yours. So I was uh, missing my unmute button. Thank you for the floor. Uh, I hope you hear me now. Um, I will speak from uh, the point of myself and, and on behalf of Kirsi Latola, who many of you do know. Uh, we are coming from the University of the Arctic. And just as a reminder, that is a membership organization of universities created by the Arctic Council. We have more than 200 members and more than 50 thematic networks and institutes. Many of those who are in this call are members of UARTIC and take part in this. So uh, this is not about telling about this organization. What I will address is the Arctic Science Agreement. Uh, and I may start by the most important thing, uh, and that is that the Arctic Council has been able to create such an agreement. Uh, that in itself is a fantastic achievement. Uh, 
the Sami Council or uh, Indus peoples were part of negotiating this in the end the agreement did not necessarily become as you would have liked it and it has the weakness that the non-Arctic states are not party to this agreement but still it is in theory a fantastic tool because it shows that the states around the Arctic do agree that science and knowledge is essential for the future of Arctic cooperation and they implicitly show that knowledge is more important than fake news and loose opinions. So the kind of society we represent is recognized to be important. And then one can have our own discussions about whether we end up prioritizing the right things or have the right understanding of who is the good partners and, and the, how to bring people along. But I think we should recognize the, the beauty of, of that such an agreement do exist. Um, I would also like in this context to make a point out of that UARTIC in collaboration particularly with IASC and the IASA, we are the three science observers to the Arctic Council and we have a very strong collaboration and has been able to produce stories like this and we have uh, also now uh, Andrei Petrov, is, I think also in this call, has is a lead author of a joint uh, paper in Nature that will be out very soon, where we talk about the COVID and how that produced a break in science in the Arctic, which of course is a problem for many of us, but how that break is also creating an opportunity for us to rethink how do we do science in the Arctic? How do we think about partners? And what is the questions of the Arctic? And who has the right and who should be part of asking the questions, just like uh, Ella Mereta just talked about. Um, so the, that little PR for uh, Andre's uh, and quarters story, uh, I think is appropriate in, the, in this point and in this presentation. Now, for the science agreement, uh, UARTIC decided that it is necessary to have a kind of a baseline, because if there's such an agreement, do produce more easy access to the Arctic and increased collaboration, then we need to know what is the problem at the point of time when the agreement was created. Uh, therefore, we made a survey where we asked people some very basic questions, which was about do you understand what this agreement is about? Do you even have heard of it? Uh, which part of the agreement, because it has a set of sections, uh, is most relevant to you? And uh, the response was, our view, maybe not impressively high, but it is quite representative. Uh, Two thirds knew about the agreement, and many countries contributed uh, and some answered on behalf of a research group or an institution, some answered on, uh, as a person. The, the thing is uh, published on our website, so you can find it there. These are the different topics of the science agreement and the question was which of those are important to you? And really everything is important to somebody all the time. I think that is the, the key answer here. Uh, but it is sharing of data is important and access to uh, and take part in research and going to places for people was a particularly strong element. If we look at the topic of indigenous involvement in the agreement, uh, there is a difference between what region you come from, how you do answer to this question. Uh, it might reflect then more how indigenous issues are handled in a society in different regions than it is reflecting what should have been maybe the value set behind this thing. But in North America, uh, to have indigenous and traditional knowledge into your project and find partners for that is a much stronger message than if you are a Russian or even a Nordic person. And then non-Arctic nations have are some kind of in-between position of this. 
one might expect that access to areas there would be some countries which are kind of the bad guys and some countries which are the good guys in terms of access some make trouble and some don't uh, our finding is that it is actually isn't so uh, first of all most people have good experience with international collaboration those who have problems are most often those who actually do not have a proper partner in the place in the country where they want to go so if you have an established partnership with somebody in the region which have the area or the kind of data you want to work with including indigenous peoples then you normally have very few problems if you think you can just march in and and do your things without asking and talking and have partnership then you more often have problems so at large the answer is there is few problems which is a very good thing as a starting point for such an agreement it will be interesting to see if things are improving but this thing is not problem free and there are many things behind it it could be that some people suspect nations to use this as a power tool to keep somebody out uh, but there isn't many of those signals in the data we gathered from this thing then i would recommend you all to go to the website of uartic and find the report and read yourself uh, because there is a much more details in this report i will not spend much more time but this is important and we intend together with IASC and EASA and, other, and uh, uh, others who would like to join us uh, to redo this again uh, when this agreement has been in function for some years so we can see if there's any change so uh, final comment on what we're up to uh, we are talking about the uh, uh, science ministerial of the arctic and here we have just put together all the names from the uh, of all kind of polar research organizations in the world and their acronyms and there are more than 100 of them at the moment so at least i don't think we need more organizations because it is almost one for each of us uh, but what we do need is then to if you don't find an organization fitting your important whatever is important to you please join those that exist and try to modify them to address what you think is important because we don't maybe you can use what exists of organizations that there are. and a good story is that most of these organizations are run by very often the same kind of people coming around in different hats and they are way more coordinated than it might appear when you see all the names popping up in a conference or in other kind of structures so that's a little reminder about where we are in the world uh, so thank you for the floor and you can remove me from the sharing screen thank you very much Lars for that excellent presentation uh, for our next presenter, uh, we have Anja Sommerfeld, and she will be speaking to us uh, as the Mosaic Project Manager. And she'll be telling us about the lessons that uh, they've learned from the Mosaic Expedition. Anja, please. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to share our experiences of the Mosaic Project. Uh, next slide, please. Mosaic is the largest Arctic research expedition ever, and that means that the research vessel Polarstern was frozen into the central Arctic and drifting with the move, movement of the sea ice over the polar cap towards the Atlantic Ocean, and that took place from September 2019 to October 2020. Involved were seven icebreakers and research vessels, and uh, we had 80 institutes from 20 nations. During the year of expedition, 250 scientists were in the Central Arctic on research vessel Polarstern. Next slide, please. 
Uh, before I can explain some lessons learned, uh, we I will need to, to spread some first remarks. Um, the first idea of Mosaic was developed at the Alfred Wegener Institute in Germany, together with the Russian Arctic and Antarctic Research Institute and the University of Boulder in the United States. Um, we clustered together with leading Polar Research Institute and together designed the Mosaic campaign. Within the 30 years of planning, Mosaic developed to the largest research expedition with more than 80 institutes from 20 nations. The aim of the expedition is to investigate the coupled Arctic climate system, so we define the disciplines atmosphere, sea ice, ocean, biogeochemistry and ecosystem. But we not only want to investigate those disciplines separately, but we want to investigate their interactions between each other. And the final and overarching goal is to improve the weather forecast and the climate, climate prediction models. Next slide, please. Um, the main lesson that we have learned during the planning phase and during the expedition itself is that one nation or institute would not have been possible to, uh, able to implement Mosaic. It is only possible with a huge number of partners, and especially international partners, that cover different aspects like the science, the logistics, or the financial part. Uh, but we need one institute that brings up the idea and forces the initiation and the implementation, and that provided the research platform Plastern. So, and that's why Avi was the leading institute of the, or, or is the leading institute of the Mosaic project. A very important step during our planning phase was that we involved the International Arctic Science Committee very early during the planning phase and they helped us to advertise Mosaic and its, its goals and its tasks and so we could engage uh, other international um, yeah, institutes that could uh, join the expedition. Uh, Mosaic always had an open and strategic um, involvement of partner countries and institutes. For example, we developed the endorsement process so that international scientists or German scientists could apply for participating in the expedition and the Mosaic Project Board um, evaluates those projects about feasibility or if they are within the scope of the Mosaic Science Plan and then decided uh, whether or not those projects could be part of Mosaic because we want to make sure that we really have a year-round measurements and that we um, yeah, avoid unnecessary duplications in measurements. Um, and to achieve the goal of really having interdisciplinary investigations, uh, we developed a, the, the following coordination structure. So we defined the Mosaic Project Board, and that means that for each of the scientific disciplines, we have two coordinators. One is a German person and one is an international person, and um, they coordinate their, the scientific work within their disciplines. And as um, at cross-cutting activities, we have the modeling activity and the remote sensing work and the aircraft campaigns. Um, for Mosaic, it was always important that we have an um, open data policy and an open data handling strategy. So uh, we want to have all data on one platform and that they are easily accessible and that they are freely, are freely available. So we um, have for the next few years, the Mosaic Consortium will have access to the Mosaic data, but from uh, beginning of 2023, the data will be publicly freely available to everybody. Uh, Mosaic is the largest research expedition in the Arctic, uh, gave us a great opportunity to um, bring the Arctic science and the Arctic climate change into the general public. So that's why we developed an uh, extensive international media and outreach uh, strategy. So we always had journalists and filming teams on board of Polarstern that could export the expedition. Um, next slide, please. Uh, to conclude, uh, I can give some final remarks. So Mosaic is a great example of international scientific cooperation to develop a strategy to address the leading questions in polar research. Mosaic is a proof of the collaboration between different international research groups and between different scientific disciplines 
that, that, that it is possible and very fruitful. Mosaic is a good example of international logistical and financial cooperation in case of sharing infrastructure and joint funding. And the best proof of a good international collaboration is that Mosaic could continue despite the COVID-19 pandemic where all the other expeditions have to be cancelled. And next to um, other important partners, Russia is a must-have partner in Arctic research. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anya. Uh, and I'm sure um, the whole community will join me in thanking you for this, uh, not just for the presentation, but also for the successful completion of the Mosaic expedition. Uh, we now have our next and final speaker in the series. That's Terry Callahan. And he comes to us as the Interact founder and the scientific coordinator of the project. Uh, Terry, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I hope everyone can hear and see me. Uh, can I have the first slide, please? What I want to do is just to describe to you some perceptions of how we started and where we are now and how we got there. <clears throat> but first of all, I'd like to say that uh, the Margareta Jonsson from Lund University is now the, the overall coordinator of Interact. So there is a generational shift from where we started to where we are now. The next slide, please. We started in a completely different way from what Anya has, uh, has described to us. And I think this is a really nice balance between the importance of campaigns and the importance also of having sustained um, initiatives. The research stations, 88 of them uh, in Interact now, many of them started more than 110 years ago, long before uh, climate change was an issue and when there were many different issues in those days. But we as research stations provide the bricks and mortar in the Arctic for any type of research that is on land. We've heard a lot about the indigenous people and we're very proud to say that our research stations, many of them, are actually in indigenous communities. So our station managers are not just um, a way into the data and the opportunities of doing research and monitoring in the Arctic, they are also some type of interface with local communities. And we do a lot of work on ethics to make sure that visiting scientists to the research stations are enlightened and contact the indigenous peoples in a correct manner. Could I have the next slide, please? We started as an organization which was completely bottom up. We weren't an initiative from a research institute or from um, a polar institute. Uh, or from a research uh, council. We were just nine research station managers in the year 2000 who decided we were pretty isolated. We had very common interests and common problems of how to run research stations, how to invite international guests, and how to make their work in the field more feasible, more successful, and safer. And that's how we started. And in terms of funding, what also is an interesting um, uh, context is that we started with a small grant, 800,000 um, euros. And from nine, we became 33 research stations because research stations joined us without any funding. They found the need to work together it was so important that funding was a secondary issue. We then grew and we developed many different types of way of working. One was an EU initiative and we were funded by the EU uh, several times. This was called transnational access and this breaks down national borders. It's a beautiful way of working. The grants are to people who work outside their national infrastructures. So immediately they have to travel to another country. They have to cross a national border. By doing that, they make collaborations and we get different perspectives and also we have a, a new type of interdisciplinary research. But the context of getting one of these grants is you have to leave your country and work with someone else in another country. And so far we've, we've funded about 1000 scientists um, to work in the field. The other barrier that we started with is that there was no Pan-Arctic funding. And when we started uh, with EU grants, the EU grants would only 
apply to the um, European countries, Greenland and Scandinavia and so on. And we could not put, uh, put people into North America or into Russia. But gradually those countries contributed and we got panoptic funding. After that, the EU uh, rethought their restrictions and agreed to funding um, access to research stations in Canada, Alaska and Russia. And that's really important because we broke down these barriers to going to different countries. And of course, the research station managers in all these countries, they are the experts at getting um, permits and uh, getting uh, through the, the problems of invitations and hosting scientists. They are the experts, they know how to do that. Together, these research stations, 88 of them, um, together host about 5,000 scientists every year. So it's quite a big operation. But we suffered at the beginning from the problem of how to compare data. If you imagine a station that has been running for 110 years, it collected its data in a very different way than new stations which had just been uh, developed. So that was one of our major cha uh, challenges with how to put all these data together from very different stations. And we have approached that through very specific um, uh, work, work packages within our um, within our work. Next slide, please. One of the important facets of why I think we've been successful is because we've shown we need to be needed. And we hear, hear a lot about needs for monitoring, needs to, for research, but that will always be there. Always, when we solve the problem of climate change, there will be new challenges. We always need science and monitoring. What we've done is we've, we've shown people that they need secure, safe places in the Arctic to work from. They need research infrastructures. The graphic here is a very simple one. Together, the research stations host over 150 um, networks, many global, um, all, everything here is international. There are all types of networks from educational networks like UArctic um, to infrastructure networks to data networks like World Meteorological Office. We are the bricks and mortar that facilitate the activities of all these networks uh, on land in the Arctic. So again, the message is we had to, we, we found that we were needed and we're still needed. And I think despite what will happen in the future for new challenges, we will still be needed. Next slide, please. The final slide is that we have a lot of activities and it's very difficult for me to um, join one of the work packages because we deal with research, we deal with uh, sustainable uh, development, we deal with the monitoring, we deal with education and outreach and uh, data access too. So I'm not sure where we fit in, but if we can help in any way, uh, please contact us and if you need more information uh, th these are the uh, social media to contact and the uh, the website. Thank you. Thank you very much Terry. Um, that leads us to a short discussion session. Uh, just to remind everyone uh, if you've joined us uh, sometime in the middle of all the talks we will have several breakout sessions. The numbers and the titles of the breakout sessions are on the slide. We request you to uh, rename yourself and please write the number of the session you would like to join in the beginning of your name. So we can allocate you to the correct breakout session. If you are unable to change your name, please let us know in the chat box and we can take care of that from our side. I have a couple of questions already from the audience, but if you would also like to ask questions, please feel free to type in the chat box or raise your hand either ways. The very first question uh, comes from Vito Vitale uh, and it's about um, the very first talk that was given to us by Hiroyuki Enomoto about the state of the Arctic science report. And uh, Vito asks, whether there is any information about the list of the most relevant initiatives that were presented at the international level and how these uh, initiatives that were there in the IASC report 
um, compared to the individual countries' submissions to the ASM3 process. Uh, Hiroyuki, would you like to take this question, please? So, can you hear me? So there is a, so ASM3 asks, asks the report from countries and that is a, a national report. So government interest and uh, researchers uh, activity are combined. And I ask report what deleted the name of nation. So science, very much science oriented. And the, uh, the some uh, structure and also uh, concept was different, but uh, some are over, even overlapped. So I ask report has a long, very long term uh, concept. Uh, it's uh, not easily uh, realized, but we people want to keep in a long term. And also emergence effort, uh, just we are facing, and especially uh, during the ICAP 3 10 years period, is uh, now is a middle term, and how to implement or improve that station and so the uh, but uh, so both uh, looking for the uh, effective international effort and uh, the I, I, I ask report uh, introduce the uh, challenge and also success story is uh, as uh, previous speaker uh, mentions interact is a very good uh, example and mosaic is also but uh, the uh, so but uh, such an opportunity is uh, so people need need to look looking for and uh, the one idea of the uh, one uh, part of that report so I is especially impressed is the uh, uh, the just today's meeting was also organized by, by European Polar Board. It's a European activity like an Interact or Mosaic uh, German activity. It's a very high, and but uh, that experience uh, can be uh, so expand to more globally uh, from uh, uh, North Arctic and also West, Western to Eastern country. So that is a uh, uh, the I I uh, pretty much impressed from the I ask uh, report and. The, the, uh, I hope some the report can, uh, will help the future uh, next discussion time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have only a few minutes now, so we'll take two short questions. Uh, one of these questions has been brought up uh, by one of our listeners, Igor Apple, and he suggests that it is difficult to understand exact contact points for particular activities and projects. So he asks all the panelists whether there are any specific contact points that you can provide, uh, which can connect you to more than one opportunity. I think I might just suggest, I might just take moderator's privilege here and say, a lot of people are quite connected within Europe. So if you need any information about European activities, please feel free to contact any of the projects or the EPB and we'll put you in the right uh, connectors. But would any other uh, panelists also like to respond to that? Lars, I think you made a really good point about having a lot of different uh, organizations and that a lot of people tend to wear the same, wear different hats in different organizations. Maybe you'd like to elaborate a little bit on that too? I don't think it uh, necessarily useful to elaborate further than exactly what you said, that uh, kind of the old, uh, the old people know basically who is who anyway. So if you don't know anyone, try to find somebody who is one of the old timers and they will help you to find the right contact you're interested in. There's a general, to my observation, extremely strong collaborative attitude in this world. Uh, there is very little negative competition. So uh, therefore one don't need to be shy contacting whoever. That's very good. Yeah, uh, one of the things we did at the start of Interact was to produce a station catalogue. 
And that actually grew into a research infrastructure ca catalog by, that was produced by EPB. So if you go to these catalogs, you can find all the activities at research stations and now I think in ships and planes in the Arctic and the Antarctic. But for the Arctic, if you go onto the Interact website, you'll be able to access a catalog where each station describes what it does, what monitoring it has, what equipment it has, and, and uh, a lot of the activities there. We also have a research and monitoring book as well, which tells you about the research um, throughout Interact as a whole. So please go to our website and that will give you a lot of information. What we don't give you, and I, I, again, I go back to Renuka and the EPB, we don't list the science projects um, that are available to join. We just list the ongoing activities at the research stations. Brilliant, thank you very much. And I'd also like to remind everyone that there's the EU polar cluster, which does bring together a lot of different European funded projects that, um, that are working in both Arctic and Antarctic. So please also feel free to contact the EU polar cluster if you need any information about any of the constituent projects or any contact details. I have been reminded that we are up with the question and answer time. Uh, so we have a short break now, but in the meantime, if you'd like to join any of the sessions, please do change your name and indicate the number of the breakout session you would like to join after this break. The five sessions are in the corner of the slide and we will also copy and paste uh, it in the chat box. I would also like to say that if your questions has if your questions have been asked um, and not answered, I will ask some of the panelists to respond to them during the break time. So thank you very much for joining us and see you in 10 minutes. Yeah, so I'm just going to actually shorten our break time because we're a little bit behind schedule and I, I want to leave enough room for um, reporting from all of the breakouts. Uh, so it says 10 minutes there, but we're just going to take five minutes. So that means we will come back here at 2.10 p.m. GMT. Um, and so it's a health break in Iceland. That means you can go get a coffee. <laughs> um, but we will all be here if you have questions to, um, and we're just sorting everyone into their breakout rooms. It's really important that you don't leave the meeting right now and then try to rejoin because then we'll lose um, which breakout room you've been assigned to. So please keep things here, but you can turn off your video, video if you'd like, and we'll come back in five minutes um, and start the breakout discussions. Folks, so we're coming back from our quick break and ready to head into the breakout rooms. I know some people just joined the meeting. Um, so it looks like you're all doing the right thing and indicating which breakout room you'd like to be part of. If you have not indicated which breakout room you'd like to be part of, um, you'll just be randomly assigned to one. So you will go somewhere and not be lost. So I'll just quickly review um, what each of the breakout rooms are, and then we'll go. So the first one um, is data management and research infrastructure. The second breakout then will be education and capacity building. The third breakout is sustained observations. The fourth breakout is societally relevant research. And the fifth is visas, permits, and other bureaucratic hurdles. So we'll go into these breakout rooms, talk about actions associated with um, all of these gaps and barriers, and then we'll come back for some reporting and hopefully have time for a few questions related to it, but um, we'll see. <laughs> all right, we're ready to go to breakouts. So we are running um, really short on time. What Andre just shared in the chat box um, was from our group with group four. Uh, he had a Google doc of our shared actions so they can add more to it um, after. What we're going to do now is go through and just have basically the reporter from each group 
um, share their actions. Because we're so short on time and I at least wanna make room for each group to share, we'll just go through, each group has three minutes to share their actions. And then if people are still free after that, we can have um, a discussion, but otherwise you're free to go as our time will have ended. Um, so we can have a quick discussion afterwards um, with all the breakouts. So let's start with group one, data management. Okay, Henry, did you want me to report? I, I see. Thank you, Peter, if that's okay. Yes, thank you very yep, much. Yeah, certainly. Um, so we don't have a fully well-formed set of actions, but we do have very key elements that I think that we need to be thinking about with respect to the, the data and the research infrastructure. Um, so we talked a lot about the need to um, ensure that we're aware of, sensitive to partnering with uh, Indigenous peoples um, and Indigenous knowledge. Um, we talked specifically about some things like the care principles, which are international scope, and then more specific things like the National Inuit Strategy on Research in Canada and different, you know, more regional um, perspectives. Uh, and, and I think it was pointed out that, that we don't have enough engagement in processes like these um, from, you know, Indigenous um, representatives and so on. So we need to think about how, how we put that forward to the policy community to provide the resources or facilitate that in, in any way possible, and obviously under the leadership of Indigenous peoples and organizations. Um, so that was one thing I pulled out. Uh, the other is more technical. We talked about things like the FAIR principles, findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable. Um, we need to, to resource that. We need to, to get it out there. Um, and there are specific things that are required that do have costs and so on. Um, so it's, it's more than a great acronym. <laughs> it actually has things that, that need to be implemented. So, so that was key. Um, a number of people um, brought out the idea of collaboration. So we have a lot of collaboration going on, but as Lars pointed out, and I put in the, the chat window and so on, we know we have lots of organizations. Um, so Terry Callahan made a, a good point about how Interact is doing this, is not necessarily trying to grow every organization to become the, these monstrous, you know, large things, but the interfaces and the connections. So we need to keep building on what's being done there and, and facilitate that through um, communication and awareness, but also resources. Um, and then I'm just quickly looking through my, my notes here. Um, cultural shift, I think, um, is a really big thing. There's still a lot of, of culture that says, hey, for, for good reasons, we recognize too, there's a lot of work going into collecting the data, so it's still seen as proprietary and so on. So we need to think about not only how do we have big sticks like, you know, holding back funding that is starting to happen now with, with funding agencies, but also what are the things that we can do to encourage people like data publication and citation and so on. Um, so I think those, those were the key things. And, you know, much of that could always relate back, of course, to resourcing, but it's also just recognizing and having the ministerial level and right on down recognizing what those core principles are so they become part of our culture. I'll leave it there and, and Henry or others feel free to uh, correct me or add to that. That was beautiful, Peter. You did it exactly in three minutes. So I really appreciate that. Set, set a good example. Um, and we'll go on to group two and they can give us their reporting. Hi. I'm Louise Huffman reporting for group two. Um, we had a great discussion and then quickly at the end tried to put it all into action. So I'm gonna do the best I can in uh, summarizing what we said. Um, one of the areas that we felt would be very helpful to education would be um, mobility or in other words, exchanges between Arctic and um, non-Arctic nations and that um, these need to go both directions, that, that uh, people that are not in the Arctic can learn a great deal from uh, having the Arctic come to their countries, but also that uh, uh, going the other direction that people need to visit the Arctic and to recognize that, that the needs in the Arctic and of non-Arctic groups are very different and need separate conversations. Um, we also felt that uh, there needs to be a focus on 
um, teacher education and retraining uh, that, that, that goes for Arctic and non-Arctic groups. Uh, Polar Educators International has been working as another point that was made. Polar Educators International or PEI is a group of networks of educators all around the world. Um, it it's began right at the end of IPY and all of the funding, there is no funding for PEI except through partner actions. Uh, we have been able to partner with IASC and SCAR and several other groups, ARCUS around the world to do specific um, projects and that we really are at a point to uh, make the, the work go much farther uh, if we had a secretariat. So PEI uh, really needs that and is able to work with educators of all definitions, not just teachers, but anyone that's in an education uh, position. Um, we, the point was also made that we need to value educators and all the work that is done um, with science, but uh, teachers have a hard time being on conference calls like this, for example, unless it happens to be a vacation day. So um, time for meetings and um, valuing work to develop resources for teaching about uh, concepts, the science concepts coming out of the Arctic. Um, That's another... just about time there. So if okay, I know, sorry about that. I will put these in the shared document and uh, hopefully people can add to it. Perfect. All right, let's move on to group three, sustained observations. Okay, uh, Rodika, I need to hear. Uh, do you hear me? Yes. Okay, so uh, group three uh, looked at uh, the role of SEON in supporting sustained observations in the Arctic. Uh, and the se second topic uh, focusing on how to um, integrate and uh, better utilize um, and bring forward the uh, indigenous uh, knowledge. Uh, in terms of uh, the role of SEON, uh, one of the uh, key um, outcomes um, has been on the need for integration. And integration in, in, on, in several dimensions. One, um, understanding that funding has in many cases a national profile and in parallel there are international initiatives the integration and the understanding, the mapping of these initiatives could support um, and optimize the sustainability of uh, needed observations. Um, the other um, aspect uh, is related to the need to uh, develop platforms to bring together all stakeholders such that this will identify uh, the benefits that um, of existing observations or proposed observations could deliver to uh, multiple stakeholders. Uh, in terms of uh, traditional knowledge, um, one uh, um, key um, finding that I captured is the fact that and Emma uh, was, uh, Eva was the one to um, highlight the fact that SEON needs to develop to, uh, a framework, needs to include a framework to address uh, funding possibilities such that indigenous knowledge uh, is developed by indigenous uh, communities in uh, projects that will, they have the opportunity to identify their own questions and enable the capturing of this knowledge separately from uh, or, or in parallel with uh, um, uh, the social science uh, findings and information such that the indigenous communities could utilize uh, the knowledge captured um, for their uh, benefit. Um, uh, the, the other um, so uh, the other component that uh, was raised was uh, 
the fact that um, research projects are relatively short uh, in duration, while sustainable data needs to feed operational systems, which in the end return as uh, added uh, knowledge and information and services that support uh, the uh, traditional way of life and the uh, Arctic communities. Um, I'm, I'm just gonna stop you there. We've just okay. hit our three minutes, but that was okay. wonderful. Love just hearing all of those actions coming out of that. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. So on to group four, Andre. Yes, uh, hello everyone. Uh, so uh, we had also very productive discussion, I think. So our focus was on societal relevance of research. And I guess from the beginning, we acknowledged that there are a variety of communities in the Arctic, both uh, different scales from circumpolar, national to uh, local, but also different types of roles, stakeholders, knowledge holders, rights holders. So we have to be really conscientious of that and when we build our community uh, relationships. Uh, one of the actions we talked about first is the work with communities from the very beginning in defining research questions and priorities, also ensuring equal and equitable engagement of you know, knowledge holders, right holders, and stakeholders, and making sure that we able to clearly separate the different roles that uh, our communities have for our research and for our common research, I guess. And then, um, of course, uh, a very important action is to focus on identifying community knowledge gaps that should precede or uh, be the first step in most of these processes so that it makes it immediately relevant and useful for, for communities as well as for the researchers. Uh, that requires allocating funding and resources to uh, indigenous peoples, indigenous communities, as well as other um, communities in the Arctic to map knowledge gaps first and to uh, meaningfully participate in follow up uh, research activities or following research activities. One action is, for example, institutionalize community funding, engagement, and connectivity within agencies or science agencies' work, such as. National Science Foundation, the European Foundation agencies, right? So, so we, that we have it institutionalized and that's uh, part of their operation, not some exception things, but, but something that they routinely would do. Um, also an important, uh, important action is continue developing ethical guidelines that could be shared uh, between uh, regions, between communities, within re between research groups, so that it will allow us to have some common ground, but also region and community specific guidelines that uh, needs to be implemented. Of course, some of the regions have succeeded already in building those guidelines. Uh, another action is to facilitate community-to-community -community relationships because they're very important, also very engaging, and also very relevant, uh, both in terms of defining what needs to be researched, but also shared solutions that uh, other communities have been implementing. That is always um, galvanizing this uh, participation of our community uh, partners. And also investing in early career scholars, whether that's Western scientists or indigenous knowledge holders, I think, uh, and we thought that it was a new generation that would in many ways push forward process of community relevance. And I think, uh, and we thought that it would be important to di direct funding and attention to that element as well. Thank you. Even with 11 seconds to spare, perfect. <laughs> All right, let's move on to our final last group. Uh, visas, permits, and other bureaucratic hurdles. Thank you very much, Linda. So I guess uh, I'm French. That's why you put me in charge of the bureaucracy. Um, I don't know what that is, but uh, I will report. So we had a great session. Uh, Fran moderated the, uh, the entire session. And obviously, the first topic that was on the list was the Arctic Cooperation Agreement that fits with overcoming some of these uh, hurdles. And there, Fran gave us a bit of background on the status, on the progress of the uh, implementation of the Arctic Cooperation Agreement, uh, giving us a bit of background that was very useful, that actually the um, Arctic Cooperation Agreement relies on the input of the community. So if there was one action point now, that would be to stimulate, actually, the community to give some feedback to the national cont contact points that are responsible for the uh, Arctic Cooperation Agreement. Fran also mentioned that 2020 was a, a odd year for the uh, for the Arctic Cooperation Agreement, less feedwork, therefore less issues being uh, actually brought to the uh, national contact point, and the uh, that led the process to a bit of a stall, I think, to uh, in this year. So there was no uh, real meeting, but um, it will take three to four years to actually evaluate really the impact of. Uh, 
of the uh, Arctic Cooperation Agreement. It needs to define its terms of reference and define also itself some actions. The second thing we discussed is the challenge for starting scientists, but also starting scientists in terms of early career scientists, but also in terms of scientists that have not done international work is to go abroad and start doing work. And to do that, you need to understand the framework, the licensing, the permits, etc. And there's really no central uh, uh, portal, central uh, gateway to do that. And that would be a very useful product uh, to do that. There are some very good examples out there. Uh, Polar Knowledge mentioned that there is a page in Canada. Uh, Interact has a fantastic handbook to, uh, to start. Um, for starting early career scientists to plan their field work, but really as a way to coordinate this dynamic landscape because it's changing very often. Those regulations and those permits, there is no central uh, place to do that. So that could be one of the actions. We touched upon very briefly on MOUs as a way to facilitate collaboration. I think there was no real answer or no real big enthusiasm for it or, or, or lack of enthusiasm. I think it's in between. I guess it's what you make of the MOUs that is the most important. Uh, then uh, one uh, comment related to uh, funding that was not really the, uh, the main topic of our group, but funding as a, as a main obstacle and maybe a, as a snowball effect, while the funding is there uh, at the pan uh, national level, so international level, then all these obstacles can be over, um, overcome and it makes it much easier to overcome those obstacles. Finally, I think we talked about uh, visas and that was one of the points that was listed in the early document where we had some action point, uh, action point listed that we need to prioritize or to, to facilitate the uh, obtention of visa for Arctic researchers that we need not have a definite answer to do that. That needs to be done both at the uh, top level and also uh, by us at the community to give back that feedback to the national contact points. One point that we mentioned is that in some countries there are some mechanisms to do that. They are bilateral, but the bilateral agreements could be a way to implement those multilateral agreements if you wish. So there are, I know that for instance for myself between Canada and Germany, we can work on that kind of level and there are ways to make it easier if you work in the Canadian North. And I think that was it. The last action that is uh, generic for all of us is uh, that we are willing to collect examples of good practices. We are we were relying on the input on the group that was in our breakout sessions, but we know that the community is much larger and there are probably some other good examples of good practices in terms of overcoming these hurdles. Thank you. Yeah, perfect. All right. That um, is the most well-managed, self-managed time uh, that I've ever seen in breakout session reporting. So thank you all to our fantastic reporters and moderators for having such rich discussions um, in a pretty short amount of time and then being able to produce so many actions afterwards. That's just tremendous. And we're really grateful for all of these discussions and to have records of all of them. Um, we are basically out of time, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to wrap up the workshop, but then um, if there's more discussion, we can take, you know, five minutes at the end uh, if people have a few more points to make before we close things down. So if we can just kind of move on to the wrap-up slide, um, you know, we were obviously really <laughs> ambitious with what we were trying to do. Um, with this workshop and we really thank all of you for coming along and participating with us. Um, the actions today will be, will, they'll basically form the basis for recommendations in the final ASM3 report. So we really do take these actions seriously um, and we, we want to find ways to kind of integrate that into the final products of ASM3. So like I said, we will post a recording um, of the panel discussion to YouTube. Um, from the European Polar Board's YouTube page, and then we'll also share that onto the ASM3 website, um, just under where this uh, workshop title is. Um, and then we will also publish the kind of action reports once they're polished um, from each group so that you can look back at that, and that will also be on the ASM3 website. So the next webinar in the series is on the 3rd of December. It's at a different time than all of the webinars in this series so that we could include more participants from North America. So it'll be at 5 p.m. GMT. Soon you'll be able to register for that workshop as well on the ASM3 website. Um, we will email all who registered for this workshop to let you know when that registration is open. The program for the next webinar is being developed and designed by ASM3 participating indigenous organizations. So we're looking forward to that program and we really hope that you will join us for that discussion as well. 
So with that, um, Jenny, I think, posted uh, the link to the survey in the chat there. So that survey is particular to the discussion um, of this workshop on gaps and barriers. So if you have more that you'd like to give or on some of the different topics that you weren't part of those breakout rooms, um, you can give your feedback there as well and we will receive it. Okay, <laughs> so <laughs> if you're still here and you have time, um, if you have, you know, direct questions that you want to ask to any of the moderators or reporters um, from any of the groups, now is the time. But uh, for everyone else, you are free to go. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Can I ask for one action point, please? Yeah, yeah. And that's to make sure that there's an international fund for translation. Mm -hmm. so everything we've done today is geared at English speaking people. All the educational resources that I produce are in English. I know there is an organization within Britain to translate, but there is no international body that I know of that is helping or facilitating tra tra translation into indigenous languages. And we want to get our messages across to them and we want to hear their messages. So uh, just a simple translation service would be absolutely excellent. I don't think it exists, but I would like to know if it does exist. So please correct me. Yep, that's a beautiful point. Any other questions from any of the participants? You can raise your hand, I believe. Do they have that function now in this larger group, Joseph? I will, yes, that's, also, that's a good point. I will allow everybody to um, unmute themselves. Okay, great. There we go. Hey, Lindsay, I'm not sure if you have been able to be looking at the chat. I know there's a lot going on there, but there's some questions about timeline for draft reports and what the process for further comments on any draft reports will be. Yeah, so I think our timeline is sort of as soon as we can manage. <laughs> um, but, you know, we do really want to get these things into the final ASM3 report. So that was our desire to have this workshop so early in the ASM3 webinar series so that we still had time for implementation. Um, in terms of comments on the draft report, I don't know, actually, we haven't thought that through. So Jenny's mentioning that the survey will be open until November 20th. Yeah, so Sophie, for the draft report, we're just talking about the, the reporting um, from this particular workshop. Am I missing any other questions? I think okay. mostly it's now, thanks. Yeah, yeah, I see I see the, the numbers going down, so I will release our uh, faithful panelists and moderators and reporters as well. Um, and just again, our utmost thanks to all of you for participating in this workshop and really making it so successful. It's it's all thanks to you. So thank you so much. Thank you. Good to see you. Take care. Thanks. See you all. Glad to Bye, be everybody. Here. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you for attending the webinar.